if you want to turn to the book of Acts right at the beginning, as you find the places that I'll be teaching, preaching on this evening, uh, join me in a continuation of a prayer from Dan. Our Heavenly Father, this is your word. Remove David Kevin Knapp from it. And may you be illuminated. We praise you for the testimony of the apostles and how they were used mightily. And the examples we'll glean from this this evening, applying it in our own lives to see where prayer and power and provision were hallmarks of not only what the apostles and the disciples did, but what you equip us for. I thank you for this opportunity, and may you be glorified. Through Christ, our King, I pray. Amen. The common characteristics of the apostles are noted in the prayer, the power, the provision. And I'm always amazed when God shows up and Brian's preaching on provision this morning. And we had no idea what each of us was going to be preaching on. So, to God be the glory. And with regard to, I'm going to attempt to give an overview of what had taken place, what the here and now was like for them at this time, and what was ahead for the 11 that remained. And first of all, I'll just give you a basic facts that many of you already know. Maybe some of these will be new to you. Uh, based on my study of the word, uh, these apostles were called by Jesus himself. And they were given specific authority to preach Christ, drive out evil spirits, heal every disease and sickness, and speak the power of the resurrection. Why were there 12? That was not a coincidence. That's based on the Old Testament and the original 12 sons of Jacob. We also have 12 tribes of Israel. So that Old Testament connection is consistent and this isn't the only significance of 12 through the scriptures. And the scriptures also tell us there were about 120 followers who beginning at Christ's baptism by John the Baptist that traveled with him. So he did have a band of followers over that three plus years of his ministry. And the significance of the eyewitness at Christ's death was very, very important and critical to being called an apostle. That's what set them apart. And just as Christ faced persecution, the disciples and the apostles would face much the same. So they knew what it was like. And they would receive the same type of treatment that Christ received. Now Judas, one of the twelve, known as the betrayer, he did not witness Christ's death resurrection or ascension. But we always want to remember that Judas was handpicked by Christ. And that will probably baffle me until I'm on the other side. However, in God's eternal plans, he had a specific purpose for Judas, and it was fulfilled. Christ told the apostles to stay in Jerusalem and to wait for what the Father promised. And Lord willing, if I continue to do this in the upcoming months, we'll do more of Acts together. And just as Christ said, you will be with me and baptized by the Holy Spirit, we know what's to come in chapter 2. But that's not for this evening. And immediately following Christ's ascension, which Dan touched a little bit upon from the reading from Luke and from Mark, Two men in white clothing stood beside them, that would have been the apostles, asking them, why do you look skyward? 
Jesus will come again next time by descending. There's a clear example of the power of the ascension to come. Dissension, excuse me. And the provision of the sacrifice that is of Christ. Now, if you'll follow along with me, beginning in verse 12, this is the New American Standard. <clears throat> then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the upper room where they were staying. That is Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas son of James. They were all with one mind. They were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Now we want to note here that to have an association with Christ was life-threatening to the apostles and the disciples. They knew the persecution. They witnessed it, how unpopular Christ was to the Israel guard, the Sadducees, the priests. And very important to note, they continually devoted themselves to prayer. Another one of those P's of the sermon title. And this was not just because they had witnessed. They were eyewitnesses. And their own lives were at risk. They had witnessed Christ himself in prayer. In assorted venues over those three years. Praying to the Father aloud. Sometimes in quiet meditation. And in isolation. To. noting that they were of one mind so there was a power amongst them that was one like one none other they had a spiritual unity of them now this causes me to ponder my own life what does my time with the father look like how often how much of what substance or do I allow the business, productivity, drivenness, rule the hours of my daily living? It's an area for growth for all of us, I know. But how better to spend the time in counsel with the king? Now, as I read the next verses, 15 through 21, listen to Peter's authoritary authoritative voice power power and then as I'm reading also remember where Peter came from and I'll touch on those points too and we'll circle back so beginning in verse 15 at this time Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren a gathering of about 120 persons was together and he said brethren the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was counted among us and received his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the price of his wickedness. And falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his intestines gushed out. Only Luke the physician could give such a graphic description of what had taken place. Internal organs, hmm, as a physician only could. And yet, and it became known to all who were living in Jerusalem, so that in their own language, that field was called Hakeldama. In Aramaic, it means the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Peter goes right to the word, let his homestead be made desolate, and let no one dwell in it, and let another man take his office. It was ordained to be the way it was. And then ask the questions. 
Was this the same Peter who walked on water? Encouraged by Christ to do so? Looking ahead and having faith? Yes, it was. He was being groomed for what was ahead. Was this the same Peter who denied Christ three times? Matthew 26, very clear. What did Peter learn from that other than the evidence that he bed, bled, excuse me, he wept bitterly following that? He had to be broken before he could be built up. Was this the same Peter who would write two books of the New Testament? Indeed, it was. It is. He led with authority by the word, quoting the psalm, crediting David and the Holy Spirit. This was the farthest thing you could get from, this is what I think, speaking. Peter articulates clearly who, what, and why Judas needed to be replaced. It's in a clear example of the Old Testament being fulfilled. The full counsel, front to back. Peter believed and he led mightily with power. Now regarding Judas, Peter points out that he was really one of them for a little while until Satan entered into Judas, at which point the power and allure of the wicked one changed him for the rest of his life to the point that he took his own life, a permanent place in Jerusalem that everyone knew was desolate and whose history would live on through all generations, even to today, a place you don't go to beyond any super fun cleanup that we know happens in our land of areas that try to be reclaimed. And then the remaining passages here, Peter gives us the detail of how Judas would be replaced. The Lord's provision. Follow along with me. Therefore, it is necessary that the men, that of the men who had accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us, of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they put forward two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, who is also called Justice, and Matthias, and they prayed. We'll come back to this. And they said, you, Lord, who know the hearts of all men, show which one of these two you have chosen to occupy this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they drew lots. For them, And the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. Those eligible to be number twelve were qualified, because they were with Jesus. They witnessed the life of Christ. They were not casual bystanders who happened to be in one of the towns that Christ ministered in, and witnessed in, and the apostles traveled together. It wasn't random at all. Not, he looks qualified, type of a selection process. The two men were put forward for consideration. Obviously proven men of God who fit the description of apostle material. Note, they prayed to God to make clear to them which of the two by seeking his knowledge of the hearts of all men. 
and it had already been ordained through his power who it would be before the cast, the lot was cast. We're going to take a little side trip. If you would, turn to the book of John in chapter 12 and read along with me. These are supporting passages. John 15, verse 12. Quite a long verse. Yes, John chapter 15, verse 12. This is my commandment, power, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Provision, Christ laying down his life. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. More provision to the apostles. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit, and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, prayer, he may give to you. This I command you, that you love one another. Supporting the selection process and how the Lord used the apostles through this. And this selection process in particular, if any of you are familiar with theater, there's always an understudy of characters in a play or some sort of performance in case the main star of the program takes ill. But they need to know everything that the star knows in the event of an illness or something comes up. And there's a study that needs to take place and the disciples and the apostles, as I said, they were being groomed the entire process through observing. And the selection process was not random at all. And that drawing of lots may appear to be random. I really had to study that to gain an appreciation. It was commonly used in the scriptures. God knew Matthias more than Matthias knew himself. And isn't that true of ourselves? Stay in tune with me, and I will show you the road ahead and use you to glorify me. Matthias would receive provision from the Lord. You won't find his name anywhere else in scripture, but there. And we know that if it was all written down and accounted, no room could hold it. So we trust this. Where did Matthias go after this? We have no idea. But we can take comfort that he served a purpose as an apostle. Now, as I summarize here, key points, the prayer, the power, the provision, exemplified the way the apostles lived. And as we close out the chapter, whether you knew it or not, we just did, it's on the eve of the most powerful Holy Spirit giving and empowering that ever took place in the formulation of the New Testament church. And aren't we the recipients of the New Testament church? Knowing that we partake in something very special as ordained by him and that we too have been handpicked by his grace, by his mercy, by his love with the desire to glorify him to make the allure of Christ an aroma that people cannot resist, yet trusting him 
to orchestrate the how, the who's, the why's, the timing, which is always perfect. May we be alert. May we be alert to those callings and opportunities that are before us. Even on a Sunday morning when someone wanders in seeking something, we never know, you just don't know, that we would be part of that aroma from hearing the truth, from singing glories to the Lord through these truths that are a foundation to our lives and to share it. And I praise the work of the apostles at that time, at that place, that we today can look back and say, Hallelujah, Lord, your ways are beyond our understanding, but they are vital and we are here because of that. Join me in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, the ministry and the account from your word, which has just been shared, may we never get weary of reading these stories, the facts, not fiction, but our very lifeblood. May we never grow weary in doing good. Give us a zeal to serve at a capacity of which you've equipped us. I thank you for the love of the brethren and the testimonies that are each different, that we would continue to aspire to glorify you and have you at the forefront of all of our conversations, all of our thoughts. O oh Lord, mortify more of our sin. Put it aside, the obstructions. Thank you for the mercy of renewing our minds and that process bathed in grace, bathed in mercy. We have a great hope. We have faith to live obediently with a tenant of joy like nothing this world could ever offer. Thank you through Jesus our Savior, I pray. Amen.